I'd like to welcome you all here this evening where we are speaking about this book, The Internationalists, um, by Scott Shapiro and Ona Hathaway. Um, I was playing a board game with my son a couple of nights ago. It's the board game Risk. I don't know how many of you have heard of that. And Scott, is that a feature in, in America? Have you heard of the board game Risk? Uh, of course. Of I mean, course. Yeah, yeah, that's what it, it was invented by a Frenchman, which is why I ask. Okay. I don't know how far these things travel. Um, but for those um, who don't know, um, it's basically, well, oh, this is how it's described in the rules. Um, in the classic world domination risk, trademark, <laughs> game of military strategy, you are battling to conquer the world. To win, you must launch daring attacks, defend yourself on all fronts, and sweep across vast continents with boldness and cunning. But remember, the dangers, as well as the rewards, are high. Just when the world is within your grasp, your opponent might strike and take it all away. Now, I have to say, playing it, I felt a little bit dirty. <laughs> it, I had to explain to my son, under the UN Charter, Article 2.4, you wouldn't technically be allowed to do this, except in self-defence or if the Security Council authorises it. It's not much fun having an international lawyer for a mother. But it also felt quite old-fashioned. And this is where I bring in tonight's speaker and, of course, the book that we are speaking about. At some stage, the premise of world domination and state conquest and conquest by force, upon which the game is based, became dated. I and many others tend to trace this back to the UN Charter. Um, our speaker tonight suggests that the new world order in which we live should be traced back to a different instrument, and that is the Kellogg-Briain Pact, or Paris Peace Pact. Um, it's interesting, the French, I think, call it the Paris Peace Pact, the Americans, the Kellogg-Briain Pact with Kellogg first. Um, so the book, though, is far from a dry legal analysis of the document, and I'm not sure how many of you in the room, it's only recently, of course, um, been published, have had the chance to read it. Um, but it really does breathe oxygen into this document. Um, I'm quoting here from Hilary Mantel and her wreath lectures. I really commend to you, um, obviously, a, a, a historical novelist, but there is a bit of, a, of the historical novel um, about this work. Um, and so to, to the authors, this document um, and, and this document itself is no more illustrative of the past than, and this is quoting from Hilary Mantel, than a birth certificate is a birth or a script is a performance. And so as I said, the book actually breathes oxygen into this document. So we look forward to hearing from Scott um, about the book. Scott Shapiro is the Charles F. Southmaid Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at Yale Law School, where he's the director of the Centre for Law and Philosophy. Uh, those jurisprudence among us and beyond uh, may know him as the author of Legality. Um, but this has been a, a foray into the world of the use of force um, and legal history. So, Scott, thank you. Thank you so much. I, um, thanks so much for uh, inviting me. Um, I'm gonna. Um, before some, uh, it was asked, um, you know, do, do I have one talk that I give to every audience? And I just want you to know that is a that is not true. I, I actually every every talk is is is, is different. And I actually had to write a new talk for this. Um, uh, and unfortunately, I'm in a hotel, and so. Um, I wrote it on my phone, so um, I'm not I'm not checking my email. Um, I'm because uh, um, um, I just wouldn't do that to you. Um, so um, that's what I'm doing here. When I just have my notes here. Okay. Um, is there a clicker? Um, should I just? Okay. 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 So. Um, uh, the the book uh, the internationalists um, is um, is about the origins of the modern world order it's about the people who helped to build it and why um, despite its imperfections it's crucial that it be defended now more than ever uh, the central argument of the book is that the origins of the modern world order can be traced to a specific date in history August 27th 1928 when the great powers assembled in Paris to outlaw war. Now, the treaty that was signed on that date um, is, in America, it's called the Kellogg-Briand Pact, and in France, it's actually 
called the Brill and Kellogg Pact, um, uh, which was made, uh, so we're giving a talk at the French Embassy and the French ambassador made very clear that it was, we were giving a talk on the Brill and Kellogg Pact. Um, um, uh, um, it's also called the General Treaty for the Renunciation of War, but we call it in the book the Peace Pact. Um, it's, it's either been forgotten or treated as a laughing stock. Um, it just seems absurd that you could end war through a piece of paper. And when uh, Ona and I um, uh, taught international law together at Yale before we wrote the book, we took the same uh, view. I mean, it just seemed like an exercise in absurd idealism. Um, but in the course of our research on, on a different topic, um, though related, on the history of economic sanctions, we discovered something that we really didn't expect, that far from being um, ridiculous, outlawing war was transformative. It was a hinge in history which ended one world order and um, created um, another. Um, before 1928, as we argued in the book, war was legal which is to say that it was a legitimate tool of statecraft for states to uh, uh, enforce their rights against one another. In fact, quite astonishingly, as I'll go on to show, um, war used to be legal, but economic sanctions were illegal. Um, after 1928, this flips. It's an uh, enormous transformation where war it becomes illegal, indeed criminal, and economic sanctions are the routine way in which um, international law is uh, enforced throughout the world. Now, the book describes this tectonic shift in, um, in, in, uh, in the rules which structure, which structure international relations, war and peace, um, but it does it narratively through a cast of characters that we call the internationalists who played a pivotal role in the outlawry of war. Most of these people we had never heard of, some we had, but only vaguely, um, but uh, we were really taken by their imagination, their vision, their brilliance, um, indeed their canniness in being, in, in being able to figure out how to take their ideas, their theories, and translate them into action. The internationalists, we tell a story of the internationalists and counterpose them to what we call the interventionists who were those who fought just as hard to uphold the moral and legal status of, uh, of war. Um, and the, 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 the strange thing about our, um, about for us for writing the book is it really overturned everything we thought we knew about international law. So you're kind of always taught, maybe you're, maybe, maybe you haven't, but it, most people are taught that Hugo Grotius was a great man, uh, the Prince of Peace, um, you know, his patron saint of the International Criminal uh, in International Court of Justice when in fact he was this awful, insufferable uh, corporate lawyer for the Dutch East India Company who fashioned the rules of law, uh, uh, rules of war to enrich himself and his client and his family. Um, so that, that was fun to write about. Um, uh, now, the book has three parts. The Old World Order, part one, which describes the uh, world that um, existed before 1928 in which war was legal and might was right. Part two is the transformation, what happens when the internationalists become successful in uh, outlawing war and the chaos that they unwittingly leash, uh, unleash upon the world. And then finally, part three, the new world order, which describes the world in which we live today, which despite, I said, its imperfections, um, uh, the internationalists succeeded um, uh, much more than probably they imagined they would, and the world in which we live is far more peaceful and prosperous as a result. Um, so let me let me begin by trying to recover. Um, so these are the three the three the three parts of the book, and I'll, let me start with the old with the old world order. Um, and I think the most uh, the reason that um, most people think that uh, outlawing war is absurd is because they don't appreciate um, the crucial role that war used to play in the international system. I mean, today we think of war as the consummate breakdown of the system, whereas before 1928, war was the system. War was the way in which states 
enforce their rights against one another. Um, and we trace this, uh, we, the book begins in 1603 off the coast of Singapore uh, when um, uh, Jacob van Heemskerk, the Dutch explorer and um, merchant, um, captures uh, the Portuguese carrack, the Sada Canarina, hauls it back to Amsterdam, where it is sold off in auction as a prize um, for 3.5 million uh, sil uh, silver Dutch guilders. Um, in order to um, defend Heemskerk, who turned out to be this guy's cousin, this is Hugo Grotius. Hugo Grotius was a 20-year-old um, polymath lawyer who uh, had no experience with international law um, and was brought in to um, try to justify why his cousin was allowed to take this Portuguese carrack off the coast of Singapore. Now, in the course of his, uh, his uh, defending his cousin and then later on when he wrote his, his, uh, his classic work, The Rights of uh, the Law of War and Peace, um, he developed this idea, this remedial conception of war according to which uh, war is a permissible remedy for wrongdoing. And the idea is simply, if states have been wronged, that is, they had a legal right, and the legal right was violated, and they had no other way to recover for that loss that they suffered, they could go to war as a last resort. Um, so the picture here is, if you are injured, or if I'm injured, we, we can go to the court, we can go to the police, um, to get the right, uh, um, uh, the, the wrong reversed. Whereas states are in a, in a position where they can't because there's no Supreme Court of the world that they can appeal to. And so that's where the right of war uh, emanates. And so Grotius said in the Law of War and Peace, when, when judicial settlement ends, war begins. Now, this is crucial um, because, as he said, uh, subject matter is the same in warfare as in judicial trials. So the casus belli, the causes of war, are what we as lawyers would call causes of action. Not just self-defense, which is what we accept today, but any type of legal wrong, including collection of debts, recovery of property, compensation for accidents, re resolution of dynamic disputes, um, any, any treaty violation was a cause of war um, to protect the freedom of seas and also punishment. Punishment was uh, also a cause of war. Um, uh, and um, what, 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 what I set out here, in the, the book spends a lot of time fleshing this out, but let me give you a very kind of schematic picture. So in, in the old world order, you have the basic privilege to use force as the kind of the, the, the core norm, the core rule. But you have all these rules surrounding it which make sense of this privilege. So let me take the first one, the, the right of conquest, which we all know from risk. Um, uh, and so why did states have the right of conquest? Well, states had the right of conquest because they had the right of war. What was the idea of war? The idea of war is, well, if a state's been wronged, it could use force, invade territory, and seize that territory and it would be the sovereign over that territory and would own any public property. Why? Because it had been wronged. And so it should have the right to be compensated for the wrong that it was, that was the cause of the war to begin with. So uh, many people don't realize this, but in 1846, when the United States went to war with Mexico, um, they, um, the, main cause, uh, the main cause of war was the fact that Mexico owed American citizens $6 million, actually $4 million. Now, um, this, is not, this is not some like something we found in the archives. Um, if you type in President Polk, who's the President of the United States at the time, 1846, message to, uh, war message to Congress, he'll tell you exactly why he went to war. Um, and he, he claims that the United States, I mean, he says it, you know, we are the conquerors, um, and we, um, we had no choice but to conquer California, New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, Texas, part of Oklahoma. Um, and, and, you know, what is now the southwestern United States because, well, Mexico owed us money. Um, and that, that's, in the old world order, that, that was all, that was all um, uh, fair game. So let me, um, um, right, so that's, that's Polk there, that guy in the corner, and that's the Mexican session of 1848. 
all because of unpaid bills. Um, so if war is legal, conquest is legal. Let me, um, let me get to this, the, the, the idea of gunboat diplomacy. Not only did states have the right um, uh, of conquest because of the, the, the right of war, they, they, they also had the right to threaten to wage war. So when Japan in the 19th century refused to engage with, in global commerce with the West in violation of its legal obligation, um, from the Western perspective. Um, uh, the United States sent Commodore Matthew Perry in gunboats into Edo Bay, Tokyo Bay, and threatened to um, destroy the port unless the Japanese um, signed a treaty of friendship. Um, um, and uh, they did. Um, all legal, all valid in the Old World Order. There was no duress defense. Um, if war is legal, there can be no crime of aggression. Can't, if it's legal, can't be prosecuted for waging war because what you're doing, the, the homicide that, and, and the breaking and entering and the trespass and all that stuff, that's all uh, legally protected. So you know, Napoleon, for example, is uh, the punishment for losing the Napoleonic Wars is that he gets an island in the Mediterranean to be the emperor of. Um, and in... Um, in, um, after World War I, the Allies uh, in the um, Treaty of Versailles say that they are going to prosecute Kaiser Wilhelm II. Um, and the Netherlands will not give um, uh, the Kaiser up because how can they? What he did wasn't illegal, which I can tell this group because the, they understand international, international law. It is like, I, I find it just so ironic that uh, the Netherlands wouldn't give up um, 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 uh, somebody, I mean, like so much, I think like a quarter of their GDP is international criminal law. Um, <laughs> so the fact, that, uh, the fact that they don't give up um, the Kaiser is um, kind of funny. But I mean, in, in, in fact, it all made sense um, under the law. Finally, if war is legal, states cannot favor either side. There was a strict duty of impartiality to favor one side over the other. For excuse me, let me be clear about this. For a neutral state to favor one belligerent over another was an act of war. It was a violation of the duty of neutrality. It would be interfering with the belligerent's right to wage war. Now, since this is a younger crowd, uh, maybe you have. Um, you know, heard, you know, the, the, or seen the, the play Hamilton, um, and there's the cabinet battle. And the cabinet battle is about this, about international law, it's about the duty of neutrality, it's where um, the United States says we cannot favor France over Great Britain unless that draws into a war. That's because it would have been illegal, okay? So, we have here a, a not just a set of rules, but an interconnected set of rules, okay? Um, you have the right to wage war, rights of conquest, immunity and prosecution, powers of gunboat diplomacy, and strict duties of neutrality. That is all going to change. Okay, transformation. Um, the book has, it's called The Internationalist, and the reason why it's called The Internationalist is because my publisher told me to call it The Internationalist. Um, <laughs> but um, there's another reason, um, and that is because um, uh, the book's got a lot of people in it. It's very populated, um, and one of the people who uh, is kind of the hero of the book, there are actually not many heroes of the book, um, but he's one of the very few, um, is this uh, a bankruptcy lawyer named Salmon Levinson. And Salmon Levinson uh, has absolutely no, I mean, he's a bankruptcy attorney. I mean, he has like no interest in international affairs. Um, then World War, t World War I comes around, the stock market gets shut down, and he starts thinking this is like an, in, in, this is like a, kind of an insane way to um, run the world, you know, to have war. I mean, and again, this, there are law students here, here and, 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 and uh, uh, legal scholars. You can understand how a bankruptcy attorney, a re corporate reorganization person would think that. He hates litigators, you know. He thinks it's like a completely what a waste of resources. Let's just get together and work it out in the room. Um, and he has this idea, this conviction. You know, the, 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 the problem is we need to outlaw war. And so he says, the real disease of the world is the legality and availability of war. 
as the court of first and last resort to protect criminal nations and their greed of aggression. We should have, we should have not as now laws of war, but laws against war, just as there are no laws of murder or of poisoning, but laws against them. Now, Levinson um, teams up with his very close friend, the, the famous American uh, philosopher John Dewey, um, and he's friends with a lot of prominent politicians, um, uh, most prominently William Bora, the, the uh, chair of the Senate Foreign Race Committee, and through a long process, which I obviously can't describe here, uh, we end up um, in, he's successful um, in this global, global social movement, which he helps to orchestrate, obviously not him alone, um, with the Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1928, and that's Briand in the middle signing um, the treaty. Um, now, the, the Kellogg-Briand Pact is, is really, it's really short. It doesn't say very much. It, the, the, the main article, there are only two articles, but really the first one's the only operative one, um, is the high contracting parties condemn recourse to war for the solution of international controversies and renounce it as an instrument of national policy and their relations with one another. So basically, to, it outlaws war. It says, we're not doing war anymore. That is, war is no longer legal. Um, now, um, what I'm gonna, what, 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 what the story of the transformation is the story of this. And it, look. Yeah, I did that. I'm just gonna do it one more time. Don't, don't look at me, look at that. <laughs> there you go. So basically what happens is it's, it's a, um, the, a system that is premised on the permission to use force slowly gets transformed into one in which, um, which war is prohibited. Now, it doesn't happen all at once. In fact, they don't actually know what they're doing when they outlaw war. They, don't re they haven't quite figured out what was going to happen when they outlaw war. What would the rest of the system look like? Now, I know what you're thinking, and, and many people think that I, I, I've thought it too. Wait a second. Um, there were wars after 1928, um, um, and I know that too. Um, um, uh, because I have access to Wikipedia um, a, a, as, as well as you do. Um, um, but the, 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 the point that, we, that, we, that I would argue is that these events which crop up after the pact are, more, are, are these kind of shocks to these statesmen um, who, um, Fig who have to figure out what will the world look like now that we can't use war. So there are kind of events which prompt changes in the rules um, uh, which um, slowly gets transformed through the 1930s and 1940s. So let me, let me give you the first example. So Japan signs the pact in 1928 and in 1931, September 18th, 1931, invades Manchuria. Now why they did that is a very, very long story why they did that. Um, it's a really, I think it's, it's really, I think it's a fascinating story why, why they ended up um, doing it, and I can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, but the point is they invi invade Manchuria, and now the, nobody knows what to do because they had just outlawed war. So how were they supposed to respond to a war with war? Um, it was like, I, I mean, I, I, feel, I do feel like it's like Homer Simpson, like, oh, like, what, what, like, what, like, what, like what did we do? Um, like we took away the main tool we had for, 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 for resolving disputes and for stopping rule violations. So one of the ideas, um, one of the initial ideas was um, developed by Henry Stimson, the, the Secretary of State for the United States, who took, off, took, um, took um, uh, the reins after, um, after Frank Kellogg. Um, and he turns out he was, a, he was um, college classmates at Yale with uh, Sam and Levinson, and Levinson sent him an article um, two years earlier, um, and he said, you know, now that there was uh, no longer a right of war, there should no longer be a right of conquest, because the whole reason for having conquest no longer exists. Um, and Stimson um, thought that this 
this was this was a great idea. Um, uh, Levinson called it the sanctions of peace rather than the sanctions of war. So Simpson wrote this um, this uh, simultaneous diplomatic notes. Um, he said that the American government does not intend to recognize any situation, treaty, or agreement which may be brought by means contrary to the covenants and obligations of the Pact of Paris, Pact of Paris being the Kellogg-Briand Pact. And the League of Nations follows suit. Uh, and so few, after that, few, very few states uh, recognize Japan's acquisition of Manchuria and then a subsequent <laughs> claim to be um, an independent state. They just treat it as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, as, as not a real state, but a puppet state. Now, it is hard to it is hard to emphasize how dramatic this change is. Um, probably one of the most ancient rights of uh, of sovereignty is um, con the right of conquest, and um, it's given up in, at the beginning of 1932. And what is the reason? The Kellogg Brand Pact. Um, so we go from the right of conquest to no right of conquest. Um, Stimson also said, he didn't just say we won't recognize any situation, any, ter any territorial change, he says treaty or agreement. So in addition to um, their uh, treaties being invalid, I'm sorry, uh, conquests being invalid, also um, treaties that are coerced are also invalid. So we, um, we go from a, a world of gumbo diplomacy to no gumbo about diplomacy, and I just, Hirsch Lauterpacht, um, uh, in the Vienna, uh, as he explains in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Article 52, which enshrines this idea that a treaty is void if its conclusion has been procured by the threat or use of force, uh, Lauterpacht explains that, um, is that uh, every state has a duty to refrain from the use of war as an instrument of national policy, insofar as war or threats of, um, uh, uh, or threats of force constitute international illegal acts, the results of those illegalities imposed treaties cannot be considered valid, okay? So we go from gunboat diplomacy to no gunboat diplomacy. Um, and then finally is neutrality. Um, through the 1930s, uh, European states experiment with, with imposing sanctions on various states for engaging in aggression. The United States takes the plunge in March 1941 um, when it um, passes the Lend-Lease Act, which enabled the United States to help Great Britain and the Allies over Nazi Germany, even though the United States is not at war. So the United States is neutral, but it claims that the Pact of Paris, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, changes the rules of neutrality. So this is, um, actually, Lauterpacht wrote this for Jackson, but this is what Jackson says, who was Attorney General. Uh, at the time, the Treaty for the Renunciation of War, again, that's the Kellogg-Briand Pact. By the way, right, uh, Ona's theory is that uh, the reason why nobody recognizes the importance of the Kellogg-Briand Pact is because it has so many damn names. Um, so the Treaty for the Renunciation of War, by altering fundamentally the place of war in international law, has effected a parallel change in the law and status of neutrality, allowing the United States to enter discriminatory trade agreements that favored the Allies. Okay, so whereas before neutrality required impartiality, neutrality permits partiality. And finally, um, if war is no longer legal, then aggression is a crime. Uh, Nuremberg, uh, the International Military Tribunal, 1945-46, we normally think of it today as being a trial about the Holocaust, crimes against humanity. But really, of course, that those counts were tried there. Um, but really, um, the trial was about aggressive war. That's why the Americans brought it. The first two counts are about aggressive war. Um, this is the first uh, Nuremberg indictment. And you'll see all these invasions have been specifically planned in advance in violation of the terms of the Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1928. Um, indeed, um, well, we don't have it here. Um, the, uh, the, the tribunal held that the only reason why the, um, that the uh, Allies could prosecute the Nazis for the Holocaust was because it was in furtherance of an aggressive war. So the, the predicate for the Holocaust was, again, the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Um, um, so what, what, what I'm trying, I've obviously condensed a tremendous amount. 
in, uh, of the discussion, again, this doesn't happen all at once. It happens over the course of 17 years. Um, but we, we go from a world in w which is predicated on the permission to wage war to the prohibition on war. Now, um, let me just briefly talk about the New World Order. Uh, the third part of the book tries to, set, tries to get people to see the world differently, um, uh, realizing that the world is predicated on the prohibition um, on, uh, on war. Um, so let me give you a, a, an example. Um, so uh, this document that you see here is the first draft of the United Nations Charter. It was uh, famously called Document 99, and it was drafted by another internationalist, James Shotwell, who was a medieval history professor at Columbia University. Um, and um, you see it says here, prepared by JTS, that's James Thomas Shotwell. Um, in 1942, he was asked by Under Secretary well, uh, uh, Sumner Wells, another internationalist, to come in and help uh, plan the peace. Now, one thing which is fascinating is that Shotwell wrote the Kellogg-Briand Pact. He wrote the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Um, he ghostwrote it for Briand. And um, when he wrote the UN Charter, the first draft of the UN Charter, he actually took the Kellogg-Briand Pact and he put it at the very beginning. I don't mean like he like adapted it. He literally, I mean, he didn't literally cut and paste it because I, I, I think it was like in parchment, but um, <laughs> but it but it was written out verbatim. Like the beginning of the the original UN Charter says, the high contacting parties hereby renounce war as an instrument of national controversy. So the point is that what we, we what the, the 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 one way it makes us see the UN Charter is it being the completion, the perfection um, of this process. Uh, Article two four of the UN Charter, which which says all nations shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or the use of force is the Kellogg-Briand Pact, is the thing that undermines the old world order and is the cornerstone of the new world order. Um, uh, just, uh, we, we have a lot of data in the book and this is one of the charts that we have in the book. We have a lot of charts in the book. Um, and what this tries to show is what we did was we went through all the territorial acquisitions from 1816 to 2015, so 199 years, um, and we uh, recoded everything and tried to see how much, con how, mu how much conquest was there per year and how often um, um, did they occur. Um, both the frequency and the um, uh, uh, scope of conquest falls dramatically. It falls before 1928 from w once every 40 years, that is once in a human lifetime, a state could be expected to be conquered once in a human lifetime, to after 1948, um, once, in, once or twice a millennium. Um, and the size uh, um, shrinks dramatically before 1928, um, there are roughly 11 Crimeas a year, put it that way, two, like something like 250,000 square kilometers, so about 11 Crimeas a year, till after 1948 you have um, uh, roughly uh, one Crimea every four years. Um, and the last Crimea was Crimea. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, and I can go over more of this later. Um, all the data, we have a, a book website. Um, all the data is online um, under the data thing. So if you like stata files, um, um, they're there freely downloadable. Um, so one of, the co uh, one of the consequences of having the prohibition on war is that weak states can survive, right? And so therefore you see after 1945, you see this dramatic increase in the number of states. You go from something about six, you know, roughly 60 states after 1945 to, depending on your count, about 193 today. Now why is because before, in the old world order, you had to be big in order to survive, um, whereas now you can be small and weak and uh, not really be worried about being conquered. Um, but there's downside to this. The downside to this is that by prohibiting interstate wars and allowing weak states to survive, you also allow um, uh, failed states to survive. 
Um, so, um, and so after 1945, we see um, really a dramatic increase in the number of intrastate wars. Um, there's a fall off, um, and then a, and then it it shoots right back up um, uh, in, in in the two th in the 2010s, and nobody really knows why that has happened. <coughs> when hypothesis is just the um, kind of withdrawal of nation, uh, um, the withdrawal of, um, of, uh, of um, uh, suppl uh, nation supplying uh, UN peacekeeping um, uh, forces. Um, but the point, the point you just want to make is that it's not all sweetness and light. There are real trade-offs um, to the prohibition on war. Um, either you kind of, it's a pick your poison thing. Either you're going to go with interstate wars or you're going to go with intrastate wars. It's, there's there's no way to to eliminate all of them um, uh, um, of course it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a push pull situation um, oh okay the la so uh, this is the last slide just to say that there's a lot of there's law in the book and data in the book um, but as you know, the book is called The Internationalist, again, because my publisher told me to, but also because um, it's a book about people, and it's about the idea that, um, that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. Um, these people, most of us have never heard of, um, but they worked hard. Um, they worked... <laughs> for a long time and they worked against long odds um, to try to transform the world. And so um, the, ho the hopeful message is, is that, um, you know, bankruptcy uh, lawyers from Chicago, medieval history professors uh, from New York, um, you know, they have, uh, they have it within their power to affect um, positive change. Thank you. Many thanks, Scott. So as you see from that fantastic um, discussion of the book, um, this is a very carefully constructed argument. There are graphs, there's data. Um, it's not about the collective memory, it gets very personal. Um, so it really reflects that history is not produced but created. I think you're really feeling as if this is an attempt to create, recreate. Um, history. Um, so when you're situated in history, you don't hear the great drum roll of fate on the 27th of August 1928. Um, you know, um, the, certainly the, the pact at the time. And you know what? I'm going to call it the Cushenden Pact because that's that's the British person who signed it. Um, so when when they were situated in this room, I mean, a lot did at the time even see it as a joke. So Mussolini, there's a quote in the book, yeah, we signed the, Ke oh, he didn't say yeah, we signed the Kellogg-Briand Pact. I defined it as sublime. In reality, it is so sublime that it might be called transcendental. Uh, and the audience laughed for obvious reasons four years later. Um, so, you know, and then my favourite was it's the international equivalent of an air kiss, was how the Kellogg-Briand Pact was described. Um, so it's prosperity that gives out the prizes, really, and we've got two of its offspring, Ona and Scott, um, here giving us a version. Now, we have another progeny of international history here today, Gary Simpson. Um, so Gary, um, I've asked to speak, because Scott and Ona have said not only did it stop state co conquest, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, but it was the foundation of the crime of aggression. Um, Gary is known I'm, to many of you at LSE. Of course, he's our chair, one of our chairs of um, international law at the LSE. Um, many of you will be aware of his book, Law, War and Crime, in terms of transforming sort of your impression of a field and understanding of a field. Uh, that certainly does that in relation to international criminal law. But I've asked him because of a particular article I set for reading every year for my classes, um, which is called Stop Calling It Aggression. And Gary tells me this is actually uh, a name of a song title that Stop Calling It Aggression. We don't like that expression. Um, Tom Lehrer. Um, yeah. 
funky, funky professor we have here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a progeny of international history, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Um, so I've asked Gary because he, you know we know that at the end of the year the ICC Assembly of States Parties are going to come together to decide whether to give the International Criminal Court jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. We act as if the crime of aggression has been consolidated. <coughs> Kelly Bring Pat created it. In fact, it doesn't exist in our. Um, current international landscape. Certainly it's not a crime over which our International Criminal Court has jurisdiction. Now, a long introduction really over to Gary to speak a little more on that angle. Thanks, Davika. Uh, you've, you've, you've kind of given away my punchline Sorry. here already. So, um, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, thanks for organising this event. And, and Scott, thanks for writing the book, uh, which is, is I, it's a heroic, it's a heroic effort. Uh, to sort of breathe life into... I mean, you, you use these sorts of phrases about the Kellogg-Briand Pact and the Pact of Paris to sort of breathe life into a corpse almost. And, and I think you've successfully done that. We're going to take the uh, Pact of pa Paris much more seriously from now on. But let me, let me, first of all... I don't want to talk about the crime of aggression. Actually, if you don't mind, you won't be surprised by that, Davika. I, I wanted to situate this in a, in a sort of genre of um, writing about international law that's uh, perhaps some of which has emerged... Uh, emerged more recently, and these this this new genre of international law seems to have uh, th at least three aspects that I think might be interesting for situating your book, and, and you'll be familiar with some of the books I, I, I mentioned. Um, Mark, Mark Lewis's book on the birth of international justice, um, maybe Isabel Hull's story about the First World War, a scrap of paper. Um, undoubtedly, Philippe Sands, uh, East West Street. So the, the first thing I'd say about uh, at least some aspects of these books is that they, they're offering, I think, and your book does this too, you're offering a sort of redemptive uh, story about, about international law. So it's not just that international law is a hero of the story, uh, and it's not just that it's central to the story, it's that international lawyers themselves are, are, are the heroes, and bankruptcy lawyers, uh, uh, he, are, he, are the heroes of the, of the story. So... I mean, this seems important, uh, and the question I would ask here is, what, what is it that we want from history that makes us go and write these redemptive histories about it? What is it about the present that's, that's taking us into this sort of history or uh, allowing us to or encouraging us to write uh, this sort of history? I mean, we think of ourselves as sort of hero scholars that just come upon, upon issues and start writing them uh, because we're naturally interested in them. But, but, but something's going on historically there's a there's a there, there's a a need out there i think for for these sorts of books at this particular time and you can see that in the reception of uh, uh accorded to philippe's book so that's the first thing um the second uh aspect of the genre and maybe i'll be a bit more facetious here really um and i i very much adopt this style is the sort of book that, that says um, world history began on the 12th of June, 1467. Uh, um, and th there seems to be a fair bit of this around uh, as well. So this reminds me of Virginia Woolf's uh, famous quote when she said, you know, the modern world began you know, roughly around mid-morning on the 20th of December, 1910. Uh, and this, there, there, there are a number of books that attempt to do this. So again, Philippe's book does this. You know, you know, the judges walked into the courtroom at Nuremberg on a particular day in 1945, and the world was radically transformed forever. And I do a bit of this. Some of my students are in the class, so you know, I, I can't argue against this, this particular aesthetic, because as, as they know from last Monday's class, that's precisely what I did. I said international criminal law began on the, the 15th of October, 1915, when, when the British nurse Edith Cavell was executed by the, the Germans. So as a, as a flourish, I really like this style. Um, as history, uh, I'm not so sure. I'm not so, so sure that history has these, has these hinges, but, but we're very attracted to them for some sort of reason. And I, I'd, be, you know, I'd be keen to explore that. The third aspect of this genre is the uh, is the idea that individuals really are at the heart of the story. So it's a it's an it's in a way it's an anti structural story. It's about it's about the heroic individual uh, changing the world, um, and we see this again with with recent histories. It's Lauter Pact or it's Lemkin or it's some combination of Lauter Pact and Lemkin. 
Um, and here, Lauter Pack emerges uh, as, as, as a hero again. I don't know if I like Hirsch Lauterpacht that much, and I, I can't say I've liked him more from reading either your book or, or, or Philippe's book. And maybe because it's, it, both these books demand that he be liked in some way. Um, but but, but there's, a, there's, there's a sort of counter story about Lauterpacht, which is maybe less, less appealing. I, I was curious about your great, great men. So you compare uh, on this on this aspect of the genre. You compare the internationalists, who I think you like, with the interventionists, who perhaps you don't like. Uh, but anyway, you, you can you can explore that you can explore that later. So the internationalists were, you know, Lauterpacht, Shotwell, uh, and Levinson, and the interventionists were Katoub, uh Schmidt, who gets a very bad run in the book. Um, and and um, uh, Amani. Uh, so it was interesting to me because, of course, two of the sort of naysayers are, are from the South, and the, the, the three internationalists are Anglo Americans. Um, so I did that. I did a bit of a little counterfactual and came up with some different names. I, I thought the I thought the, maybe the, the the interventionists we might say are Bush, McDougall, <coughs> Slaughter. And the internationalists would be, you know, Nehru or Du Bois or Gandhi or, or, or Sukarno. Um, and maybe this is not just a game. Uh, it seems important that the book would have chosen uh, Anglo-Americans as the heroes of the, of the story. Um, so I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that, because I think it will, it will, feel, like a, it will feel like an Anglo-American story in some places, and maybe it is. Uh, I mean, you say at one point, uh, in light of these assaults on the system from from non-Anglo-American sources, uh, uh, the, the, the Caliph, uh, uh, Iran, and so on and so forth, Russia, China. So in light of these assaults on the system, it's not unreasonable to ask whether the new world order is simply too far gone to be saved. Why should the United States and its allies continue to support international institutions and the rule of the legal order? I just don't know if that sentence would make sense to lots of people in the world. Um, maybe, maybe it wouldn't even make sense to lots of people at the LSE. Uh, I, I suspect that, 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 that maybe the room's divided on these questions. I don't know, but I, but I think there'd be a really immediate and visceral re reaction to a sentence like that in, in, in British international legal culture. Um, that, that's my sense. So again, I, I don't know, well, what's the point? We'll, we'll talk about this later. Um, so let me offer up, uh, let, let, let me offer up maybe three or four uh, counter images to your story about the Pact of Paris and its transformative effect on international law and relations. And I, I really offer them in a sort of heuristic vein. I, I'd be curious to know what people think of them. I'd be curious to know what you, you think of them. And let's face it, four heuristic images don't sell books. So I, I appreciate that this is, this, it, it's, it's much more effective to produce the sort of compelling uh, and well-researched history that you've produced. Uh, so so one, one counter image would be, would, be, would be the Schmittian image. Uh, that maybe Carl Schmitt's right I mean, he doesn't, as I say, he doesn't come across well. Uh, very few Nazis do, let's face it, and you describe him in those terms in the book. But, but maybe, his, maybe, his, his, maybe his description or characterization of the system is, 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 is compelling. Maybe the, the move to making war illegal actually just made a particular type of war lawful or clothed a particular sort of violence in law, in law and, and made that violence more, if not more violent, at least more hubristic uh, and more vain and more dangerous and somehow disguised its true effect on the world or its true intentions. Um, that maybe the move from the, 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 the European dual system of the 19th century to this, what E.H. Carr called a harmony of interests, the, the way in which the great powers in the, in the 20th century came along and said, we no longer act as sovereign states in an inter-sovereign world. We're not like that. We're above it all now. When we, when we go to war, we're acting in the name of, of, of humanity. So, so are they cheating when they, name, when, when they act in the name of, of humanity? That would be the question. So that would be one counter image. Um, a second counter image would be, um, so Martin White, uh, 
as you know, taught here in international relations 20 years ago. And, and I guess his response to this story would be actually nothing transformative happened in 1928. In fact, nothing transformative ever happens in international relations. Uh, only international lawyers want to believe in transformation and they want to believe that they're at the heart of it. But in fact, the international system is just a realm, as he put it, of repetition and recurrence. This, this is, so there's a constant pattern of great power warfare, combinations of war and peace intervention. Sometimes there are a lot of civil wars, sometimes there are lots of international wars. That will really just depend on the accidental configuration of sovereignty in the world. So that when we look at Com Commodore Perry uh, <coughs> saying to the Japanese, the alternative is friendship and, and, or war, we might say, well, that, that sounds extremely familiar to us. I mean, we, 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 we just have to look at Donald Trump and his offer to the North Koreans or his offer to the Iranians and see, and see a very strong familial resemblance between the sort of pre-1928 revolutionary picture and the post-1928 picture of the world that we're currently in now. So that would be a second image. Um, a third image, uh, I think more sympathetic to your book, would be the idea that, that, that gradualism is what happens in, in law, law and politics. So a slightly more upbeat version of this would be to say, yeah, actually law has had a major impact on the way people think about war and, and peace. And there, you know, there, has been a move to, um, there has been a move to making war illegal, and that's actually had effects on the ground, but... But this has all been very gradual. This has taken place over a period of, I don't know, 100 or maybe 500 years. Uh, and we're slowly and incrementally moving to, to a, a better uh, world order. So maybe the, the, the tagline would be a better world order rather than a new world order according to these incrementalists. Um, and then the, the fourth counter story would be, would be just new dates. And I can imagine what's happened uh, when you've spoken in other places or, 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 or when the book's been reviewed is that people have just offered other dates. They're, they're hung up on 1945 or 1989 they, or like me. Or like they, me. Just, they just agree with me. Yeah, they no, do no, agree no. with you, of course. So I am uh, secretly <laughs> agreeing with you. No, I, um, so, so my counter date has always been, you know, 19, 1918, 1919, the, the sort of Versailles moment. Um, um, but I don't think I would go to war over that date. You know, I wouldn't say this, this is the absolute date. Um, so, so I can imagine there, there are a series of counter dates. Okay, so um, one of the questions, I, I said a reading on Monday to my students, and they, they may remember, they may not, but I said, don't forget to read what's in the, in the reading. As, uh, as I quoted E.M. Forster, actually, the only way to find out uh, what's in a book is to read it. Uh, 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 but I said, don't forget to take a close look at what's not there. And so I, I applied this test to your, your, your book. And, and what wasn't there so much uh, was Chile in 1973 or, or Guatemala in the 1980s. Or actually, the Iraq War wasn't there that much, which I was kind of relieved by in a way, but, but, but still <laughs> struck by. Uh, and Kosovo appeared once. Um, Iraq is there. Iraq's there a bit, but 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 yeah, okay. So so that so one question would be, you know, what do we do about all the the the, the, the illegal wars? Uh, but I'm not so interested in that question. I'm interested in 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 what do we do about lawful violence? I mean, has this switch just been a switch from I don't know illegal war that we can all recognize and condemn to lawful violence? And I presume it's just as bad to die in a lawful war as an illegal war. So a lawful violence that we can't recognize for what it, for what it is. The really, the really dangerous thing that's happened in, uh, in, international, in international law and relations. So, you know, you mentioned Homer Simpson. I'll, I'll give you Sim the Simpsons back. I've only seen about three episodes, but once on a plane, uh, on a plane, I, I watched an episode of The Simpsons and it featured Homer Simpson. He, he, he went to... He was at the supermarket in, 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 where is it? Springfield. Springfield. He's in the supermarket in Springfield. I'm just luring the Simpsons fans out here. He's in the supermarket in Springfield, and um, he sees these army recruiters. And they're saying, you know, come and join the army. You'll see the world. You'll be paid a lot, and you'll learn French or whatever. And he says, yeah, I'm, I'll sign me up. And he's just about to sign up. He says, but, but wait a minute. Don't I have to fight a war? 
you know, don't I have to fight a war? <coughs> and they say very smoothly, I said, no, no, this is in a very, very Schmittian way, in fact, they say, no, don't worry, we don't fight wars anymore. We, we engage in peacekeeping and peacemaking and, peace tra and, and state transformation and so humanitarian <coughs> interventions. This was how it went. It was a very, very telling moment. Um, and I wondered if that's what's happened, that somehow uh, violence has, has moved sort of <coughs> offshore, it's moved into the juridical realm and we no longer uh, recognize it for, for what it is. And uh, that was the transformation in 1928. And, and, and your book is subtle on this question. You're, 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 although it, see, it looks as if you're in favor of 1928, you're, you're fairly well aware of the adverse consequences of the 1928 <laughs> moment. One of the things I, I, I admired about the book um, so the, the, way law is, the way law is positioned in this story seems to me to be absolutely crucial. And I'm, I'm always reminded of, and some of you may have heard me talk about this before, uh, of an interview that, that, that Tony Blair gave at the end of 2003 with John Humphreys from the Radio 4 uh, program today, where he was, he was asked, he's, you know, do, you, do you still support this war? I mean, it's, it's been a disaster, hasn't it? There's, there's ethnic warfare, there's a rise in terrorism, there are no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, what, you know, what do you say to this? And Blair said, well, you know, all that might be true, but don't forget, we had 13 Security Council resolutions authorizing this war. And um, I thought, yeah, law is the last man standing here as far as justifying the unjustifiable. So I think a counter story would have to emphasize the way in which uh, law can be used uh, in, that particular, in that particular way. So I think I'll finish, I think I'll finish there. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, there's a chapter in the book called God Save Us from the Professors. It's <laughs> quarter to eight. I was supposed to give Scott a chance to respond, but you know what? No due process here. We're very Churchillian. Um, so, because I do want to leave space for questions. Do you mind, Scott? Uh, no, I have to... <laughs> okay, moving on. So, um, if you have questions, we do have 15 more minutes, and Scott can weave, you know, in his amazingly poetic way, weave his response to Gary and Tree into his answers to your questions as well. Could I invite any questions from the floor? We would love to hear from you. God save us from the professors. Eduardo. My question aims to, to link the past with the future, if that is possible. I haven't read your book, but I already have a copy of it. I wonder to what extent your theory is grounding uh, the following point, that the, uh, the evolution of international law is fundamentally spiral rather than circular, in the sense that before 1928, it was basically <coughs> standard-based, I mean, uh, uh, something related to the state of nature in Hobbesian uh, vocabulary. And uh, now, with the emergence of um, electoral shocks such as Trump and um, individuals like Mr. Kim, we are starting a new era that arguably goes back to go back to, 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 to the pre-1928 era. So we are somehow going back to the state of nature in which war, why not, I mean, nuclear war, could be a potential solution to, to certain problems. So my, my point, my question is, to what extent the, uh, an important point you are encapsulating in your um, book is that the evolution of international law is fundamentally spiral from being standard-based before 1928 to rule-based because the prohibition of war, I think, is, is an example of a, of a rule. Yeah. And now we are going back to a standard-based, uh, functionally equivalent to the state of nature using a Hobbesian <coughs> uh, vocabulary. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. So I'm going to, tr I'm, uh, I'm not, uh, so I don't, slight anyone I'm just say that I'm going to speak give short answers so so that um, so it's not a reflection on, on the question so um, so I would say before 1928 it was not a Hobbesian state of nature it was rule-based there were the pro the permission to wage war was a rule the right of conquest was a rule the strict rules of neutrality were rules um, but you are right and the way we describe it at the end of the book is that we're at an inflection point and um, I would say that we're at a danger. We're at a dangerous part of count, of retrenchment. Um, and um, I do agree with you. Like there's this sense 
that you know the United States, uh, the, the President of the United States, can say we should have taken the oil. The sense in which the Palestinians are the they're the fundamentalists. Um, I mean that that um, this is terrible. This is really alarming, and um, you know uh, we didn't mean for the book to be uh, uh, you know be preachy at the end, but we preach um, at the end um, because it needs to be preached. Um, and I would say, um, and I, I won't, I won't get to this now, but I, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, you know, the, the, the great achievement of 1928 and then consolidated in 1945 was this world created, um, and this whole system of rules based on the prohibition on war. And that is though, though often, um, honored in the breach. Um, it has obviously not been um, um, uh, 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 followed um, uh, perfectly by any means. Um, it was way better than what it was before, and uh, we are in danger of um, reverting um, either to the pre-1928 world or to another world like the interwar period where we don't know what the rules are anymore, which is the war that is a state of nature. say a word about uh, a topic which seems to be in the news at the moment, that's the proliferation of nuclear weapons. I mean, uh, it was <coughs> was well received that the Nobel um, Pro Peace Prize went to an organization that was as active in the campaign against the proliferation. But on what basis on in, in international law does one country or group of countries forbid the acquisition of nuclear weapons when they themselves have it? Yeah. Um, so uh, so th this is a question in some sense of field um, because there's the basic principle, and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm, I'm sitting here with experts on it and I just pl play one in the book. Uh, I'm an uh, international lawyer. Um, uh, the, the basic rule is that international law, you're allowed to possess Nuclear weapons are just not allowed to use them, um, and um, there are there's the uh, there's the NPT, the no Nuclear uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, and and then the Security Council can step in and impose additional um, restrictions. Um, so that's the basic that's that, that's just the basic rules uh, um, um, without any nuance. Um, I will say that. Um, you, you're talking about the women in the book. I, we, one of the groups we 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 we, um, we work with is the um, the uh, uh, Women's International, the Women's League, Women's International League for Peace and, and Freedom. Wilf. Um, and there we have a picture of them in the book. Um, they're still going. It was started by uh, Jane Adams, and they were really excited because um, um, uh, not only because you know anti-war groups are not doing well these days. I mean, it's not a particularly anti-war culture we live in. Um, but also, um, they, is so touching. I mean, they, they meet and they talk about the Kellogg-Briand Pact as this great achievement. But they, 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 they was been suggested to us that, that we could take this opportunity when we go around talking about um, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, but we also talk about this new um, uh, nuclear ban treaty um, and that the, the group that led it just won the, the Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize. Unfortunately, I mean, I, it, they seem very different than the Kelly Brand Pact. That the, the thing about the Kelly Brand Pact is they had the great powers on board. The problem is that no nuclear powers are on board for this treaty. Um, and so the, 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 the thing about the internationalists is that they were, they were idealists in one sense, but they were pragmatists. And they knew that in order to get anything done, they had to make deals and be friends with people that they weren't particularly in love with. I mean, Levinson did not like William Bora, um, but in fact um, um, uh, worked with him. Um, and Frank Kellogg was, I mean, one of the reasons we didn't call it the Kellogg brand packed in the book is because Kellogg was an awful person um, and who stole the Nobel Peace Prize from Sam Levinson. I mean, it's a, when, when the, I mean, 
of the many tragedies in this book, that's one of them, um, is that he really did. I mean, he stole it in the, in, in, almost literally. Um, uh, and so um, the, I think that the, you know, the Kellogg-Briand Pact uh, um, is different than the nuclear, te uh, nuclear ban treaty, precisely because um, one was a global treaty, which had the great powers, whereas the n nuclear powers are not members of the nuclear uh, ban treaty. I'm sorry. Was that when he said he couldn't remember his name? Yes, he. Uh, so he said he. So um, uh, there was movement to get Levinson to uh, get the Nobel Peace Prize, and um, and uh, Kellogg, um, uh, and, and and Levinson and Kellogg um, uh, worked for a long time together on this, and then he sent he uh, created a campaign to um, to uh, um, uh, run Levinson down, and we have one of the letters that we found in the archives said, um, there's a particularly bumptious man named Levinson, I've forgotten his first name, um, um, who's, who really did nothing in this whole thing, when in fact, you know, it was really his his idea. So I hate, I hate Frank Kellogg. Um, 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 so uh, I went, uh, um, yeah, I, uh, let me just leave it at that. I think it's best because they're they're filming this. <laughs> Did you have a question? Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Okay. Um, it seems that you're making the argument that the content of of the pact and rendering war illegal was the primary cause of the period of peace and the new world or order in which we live in today. Well, as, as a historian, I, I, I'm very skeptical about this, yeah. es especially how would you respond to the argument that it was really American superiority which led to yeah, this, sure. this, this new era of peace that we live in, or how about the Pax Britannica even a century yeah, sure. earlier, and uh, even the use of nuclear weapons. Mm. Uh, would Cuba not have been a war but for yeah. the existence of, yeah. of nuclear weapons? So. I, I wouldn't argue that, that the treaty wasn't important, but how important was yeah, it yes. really? So, so um, of course you're skeptical. What, like, what thinking person wouldn't be skeptical about this claim? <laughs> um, uh, it's like, that's why we wrote the book, because like to convert skeptics, because um, um, if everyone agreed with it, then like very few people would buy it. Um, so I appreciate your public commitment to buy the book. Um, uh, the um, what, what I would say, and again, we started as skeptics too. I mean, again, it just seemed ridiculous. And of course, you think nuclear weapons, uh, global interconnection, Pax Americana. I mean, all these reasons. I mean, we discussed this in the the the, the, the book. Um, so the first thing I, I want to say is um, that. Um, uh, you know, let me let me just take nuclear weapons because that's what everyone's favorite one, the nuclear peace hypothesis. And there are a thousand peace hypotheses, capitalist peace hypothesis, dem democratic peace hypothesis. And let me just talk about the nuclear peace hypothesis. I could talk about the other ones later. Um, so um, notice that all these changes occur before the invention of nuclear weapons. They're already in place, right? So. That's the first thing. Now, the second thing I want to say is that we, we don't deny that nuclear weapons are important in preventing wars between great powers. It's just that part of the explanation for what nuclear weapons are, are used for is a change in norms. That is, nuclear weapons are used now to, to, uh, for defensive purposes rather than offensive purposes. Now you might say, well, we, you know, who would use nuclear weapons for offensive purposes? Well, well, they used conventional weapons for offensive purposes all the time. Um, and uh, why? Because the rule was you could use whatever weapons you had, um, um, which gets changed towards the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, but basically whatever weapons you had, you could use in order to enforce your rights. Nobody would use nuclear weapons for that purpose anymore. No one would say, you owe us money, and if not, we're gonna use a tactical nuclear weapon. Um, why not? Because you just can't do that anymore. So the point is not that the nuclear peace hypothesis is false. It's just that it's an incomplete explanation. It requires the fact that the norms have changed to 
fully complete the explanation. It's, it's true for all the peace hypotheses, and I can I can I can march I can march through them. Um, uh, um, why they're they're an un they're they're an assumed implicit premise which is never articulated, and the the claim that we that we want make in the book is that if you actually worked out these explanations, you'd always see that one of the premises is that well actually. The only proper, the only legitimate um, uses of force now are defense, defensive rather than offensive. Whereas offensive doesn't mean aggressive; it means in order to enforce a right. I think we've got time for one more question. Yeah. 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 Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm just interested to know: Does this new world order that you talk about? I mean. Um, would you personally say, as a, as a philosopher, um, um, uh, that it's more moral to, um, if someone attacks you or hits you, is it more moral to hit them back or to take them to court and give them a criminal record? Yeah. Um, so, uh, right. So, um, one of the one of the ideas in the book is is not is not that in 1928, um, uh, when war was outlawed, power doesn't matter. It's not that imperialism ended in 1928, 1945. No, it's just the nature of imperialism and the nature of power changed. Um, we went from gunboat diplomacy to checkbook diplomacy. We went from kind of violent forms of imperialism to economic imperialism. Um, and then people will say, um, well, you know, that's really bad. And I'm like, yeah, but what's worse? Um, it turns out that um, economic imperialism, as bad as it is, is better than um, um, uh, military imperialism. Not always. Um, uh, there's been a lot of harm caused um, through uh, various neoliberal forms of, um, of economic imperialism. We all know about that. Um, but the question is, which world is better? a world in which you can use force to enforce your rights, or one in which, you no, know, you have to basically use trade and tariffs and money in order to enforce your rights. And it's, the latter is a, not a morally benign one, but it is, uh, has fewer moral costs than the other. And so it is not a story of sweetness and light. It is a story of, again, picking your poison. Mm. Okay, well, Scott, you might have finished this book, but I think the, the debate about it has really just started. Um, a central message in the book is that ideas matter. I think despite many provocative claims and central claims, um, that is the important thing. Katrina, Gary and Scott, thank you, thank you very much. Thank, okay. you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.